Would you stand for the reading of God's word? I'm starting from verse 17. When it was evening, he came with the twelve, and when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him one after another, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink new in the kingdom of God. This is the word of the Lord. Well, when Passover came, the Jewish people in Jerusalem all gathered together for a special meal in their homes, just as they do today. And little did the disciples know that the meal they would be offered that night would be hard to swallow. In our scripture lesson for tonight, we have the institution of Holy Communion. Here it is treated as a real meal around the table with disciples reclining as they did. In early Christianity, this is how the church then spread, reclining around a table, eating dinner, and then during the dinner, readings would be shared, communion would be served, and using these very words that are now our liturgy that we use for communion. This night was a defining moment for this band of 12 brothers, friends who had worked and ministered together for three years. This was the chance for Jesus to speak in a relaxed yet serious way about what was about to happen, his betrayal by Judas, Mark says, and his subsequent arrest. It was a night that would eventually lead to Jesus' darkest moment. We have in this passage several key points that must be made at the outset, the first of which is that the meal continues to be an important theme for Jesus. Throughout his ministry, Jesus used the meal as a way of including everyone. But not only that, he also used the meal as a way of providing real food bread, which symbolized the material basis of existence for a peasant audience. This Last Supper emphasizes meals and food as part of God's justice. The Food Bank of Eastern Oklahoma estimates that Oklahoma ranks fourth in the nation in the number of people who are hungry at 6.5 percent. We rank fifth in the nation at 15.2 percent in the number of people who are hungry at times during the year due to lack of money for food. 25.4 percent of Oklahomans report that at times during the year they do not have enough money to buy food for their that their family needs. That's one in four Oklahomans. We are justice-driven disciples, and part of our call is to see that God's justice is done when it comes to real food in the lives of all. One of the twelve comes this night with a plan of his own, a plan to turn Jesus over to the Jewish authorities, the pressure of being in Jerusalem, the hotbed of political pressure between Rome and the Jewish authorities caused one disciple to 
crack under pressure, so we say. We are told by Mark of one of Jesus' trusted friends betraying trust and giving him to the chief priests. This may be the hardest blow of all. But I was intrigued by one commentator's take on this reading in Mark. Let's read that text again. Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. And at that table set for that last supper, when Jesus says the one who has dipped the hand into the bowl with me will betray me, which one is that? Which one was that not? Did they not all partake? Did they not all fall away? Did they not all betray? At our table here tonight, who is not among those asked to dip the hand into the chalice with the Lord? Who of us has not fallen away? Who of us has not betrayed the Lord? Is there one? Have you not betrayed your Lord? Our response to this question can work like the finest barometer to mark our spiritual condition. For just as much as we defend ourselves, just as much as we make ourself right and another wrong, in just that measure, we are not trusting that God sees all, holds all, gives all, and forgives all who desire to be forgiven. Within that hard blow of betrayal, of the disciples falling asleep three times, of Peter denying three times, within all of that, we have the story of Jesus, that that Jesus persevered through it all. In the garden, he could have turned and run out of fear, but he didn't do that. He went before us and walked a path that we, this 2,000 years later, we still marvel at. He walked into the face of death. And the betrayer, who Mark calls Judas, Judas was the key to that. He was the gatekeeper for Jesus to enter that door which brought him to the feet of Pontius Pilate and to death. As much as I want to turn against Judas, I can't, for I have betrayed him too. Do you notice in this passage also the feeding of the 5,000? There are four verbs that we find in this text, took, blessed, broke, and gave. Those same words are found in the scene where Jesus feeds 5,000 people with a few loaves and fishes. In that scene, Jesus does not magically have it rain down manna from heaven. Instead, he takes what he already has. Five loaves, two fishes. And when it passes through Jesus' hands... There is more than enough for everyone present. There is enough for everyone, another just distribution. Also, we see here that this is a Passover meal in memory of that first Passover when God's Spirit passed over the Jewish people who had put blood on the doorposts of the houses and saved their firstborn sons. And in remembering that first Passover, we say together that all of us gathered were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and we share in the liberation of all at the hand of God. Then we have this connection of body and blood with the death of Jesus. Jesus doesn't just speak of 
bread and wine as symbols of his body and blood. Rather, he has all 12, including Judas, actually partake of the food and drink. They all participate in the bread as body and the blood as wine. It is a final attempt to bring all of them with him through execution to resurrection, through death to new life. And we are invited to travel with Jesus through execution to resurrection. Now somehow, deep within that darkest of moments for Jesus was a seed of light in a strange and ironic way. We who are followers of our Lord cannot miss the veiled light that comes through the darkest of nights in Jesus' impending death. The darkness is never complete darkness for us because of what is to come. On this past Sunday night, my Vesper sermon was an attempt to prepare us for this week, and I suggested four ways of mapping our way through the week. It was probably my first four-point sermon. Uh, I must say, I was very proud. Uh, and I used prayer, humility, watch for signs, and wait on God. Those were my four points. And I hope we have prayed and humbled ourselves, watched for signs, and waited on God. We ourselves have been on a pilgrimage, and the best thing for us tonight is to be right here in worship as we look again at this night and continue to watch, wait, pray and listen for God's voice. The new Frontiers Sunday School class uh, invited Dr. Walter Brueggemann to their class on that Sunday of the Barton Clinton Gordy lectures in February and he chose to teach about a psalm of lament. There are several of those in Psalms and he chose Psalm 73. So I was preparing for his arrival in the class by teaching two sessions on Brueggemann. That's a tall order, I must say. Uh, I read and watched several videos that were on YouTube uh, about his understanding of lament that I think is helpful for us tonight. Lament is what we're doing tonight. We lament that Jesus walked this awful journey. But hear what Brueggemann says about these special words in the Bible about lament. Psalms of lament, he actually calls them psalms of disorientation. I like that. Psalms of lament are prayers that seek to mobilize God on the assumption that if you don't summon God, nothing will happen. This shows the power of prayer. We are summoning God into the transaction because God has the power to change. Prayer causes God to do things that God wouldn't otherwise do. Hmm. Now, theologically, what does that say about God? That, that God doesn't act unless we act? But we know that God acts oblivious to what we think or do, the gift of creation, the earth, the moon, the stars. All of creation continues to grow and develop without our input. But it, it's saying when we're lamenting, when we are hurting, when we have a crying need, our prayers get God's attention. Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, cries out, If it's possible, let this hour pass from me. Remove this cup from me. That prayer, that prayer got God's attention. 
And what we see from that point on is a Jesus who is then fully prepared for the hard journey ahead. Now, I am a lover of history, and I appreciate so much the mighty struggles that brought our nation together, that tore that nation apart again, and then once again together. We were recently in Washington, D.C. over spring break where I got to take my two stepsons, Brian and Ben, to see the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights right there under the glass uh, for the very first time for them. I showed Ben the actual signatures of George Washington, Ben Franklin, John Hancock, Thomas Jefferson, we have had many dark moments in our American history, and some of our darkest occurred in the very beginning of our nation, when it did not seem that we could win a war against England. We were outnumbered. We were out-trained. We were out-everything. But the cause before us was so worth what fighting for, independence from England. When George Washington was in charge of the Continental Army during that fateful year of 1776, the view on the horizon was very bleak. He'd had a series of battles in New York uh, that were lost. The Battle of Brooklyn, the Battle of Kipps Bay, White Plains, and Fort Washington. And he was in a desperate need to, for a win. With ragged men as soldiers during the autumn months of October through December, men who were dispirited, without the proper clothing and supplies needed for war, Washington called for everyone, including Congress as well as his soldiers, to persevere. It was probably one of the darkest moments for the uh, army, the Revolutionary Army. Cornwallis and his generals were advancing and had already won numerous battles and taken several cities, including New York City. And as the year was coming to a close in December, Washington began to believe that he could make a strike at the enemy at Trenton, New Jersey. A force of 1,500 Hessian soldiers were there. You remember the Hessians? They were German, German mercenary soldiers, and they fought on the British side. But it would mean that Washington's army of 2,400 at that time would have to cross the Delaware River. Snow was falling that fall. The Hessians were commanded by Johann Rall. 56 years old, who never anticipated an attack in snowy weather. It was set for Christmas night. Washington crosses the Delaware River with all of his army on Christmas Day. While experiencing this brutal northeaster storm, windy and snowy. And the attack began the next morning at 8 o'clock. Washington's uh, men, having been on their feet all night, wet, cold, weapons soaked, fought as if everything depended on them. And within 45 minutes, Commander Johann Rall lay dying. The Hessians had retreated into an orchard and were surrounded, and they laid down their weapons and surrendered. Incredibly, in the midst of all the savage fighting, only four Americans had been wounded but not killed. 900 Hessian prisoners were taken, 500 escaped, but 21 killed and 90 wounded. It was the win that Washington desperately needed at the end of 1776. But the war would not end for another seven years, seven years. But out of this bleak and dark time came hope that 
Perhaps the colonists could match wits and strategy with England on the battlefield. Throughout it all, Washington, not a brilliant strategist, really, not a brilliant tactician either, and not a gifted orator or intellectual, Washington learned from his experience and never gave up. Always he called for perseverance from Congress and his officers, perseverance and spirit and courage, qualities that served them well in the years ahead. Perseverance is a quality that we need this night. As we travel with our Lord, we need courage, we need spirit. And now we're about to come to the table of our Lord. As you come, picture yourself walking with Jesus to the garden, to his trial, walking the street to Calvary. Take, this is my body, taunted and beaten. Trust that with God, there is always more to the story than pain and suffering. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, suffering to the point of death. That's not the final story. Even in the darkest of moments, there is more to come. There is much more to come. Amen.